All right. Well, welcome. This is the this is the departure from the actual. You guys can hear me, okay? Everyone, okay. Um, this is a little bit of a departure from the <clears throat> the actual um, physical planning of the facility, and we're going to be moving more into a discussion on sustainability and resiliency. I think it. Um, you know, we've we've had enough meetings that the the core team on site here know the people on the phone. But why don't we <clears throat> why don't we go around uh, with introductions just so everyone's clear on on uh, on what people do <clears throat> within the uh, stakeholder group, and then uh, for the stakeholder group, we'll introduce our team and what they do. Uh, so starting off, uh, Anne, uh, you're in the upper left, so. Okay. I'm Francine, the first call from Sixth Office in Colton, and we're uh, working with the Gay Consultant Project. Uh, so we're here locally in Lawrence. Can barely hear you, Anne. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I live here locally in Lawrence. I'm Anne Van Gersaga. We're Shockey Consulting, and uh, we're working on the engagement piece. Hear that? Yep. <laughs> I mean, someone right, call uh, Gary. Yep, Gary. <clears throat> Gary Emmer, senior project engineer at the city of Lawrence, and uh, I'm the city building engineer. Uh, John Havrilla. I'm John Havrilla. I'm with Wendell, and I'm the director of alternative fuels. So I get involved in anything compressed natural gas, hydrogen or battery electric vehicles. Uh, also am in the energy group and work a lot with uh, solar and other you know, battery storage, other technologies. Oh. Okay, and Adam? Everyone, Adam Michael, transit manager for the city of Lawrence. Okay, uh, Dan Adet. <clears throat> I'm Dan Audet. I'm an engineer with Wendell, uh, working on their energy team where, you know, we help figure out how to reduce energy and, you know, save money doing that. Okay. Uh, Felice? Felice Laverne, Transit 92 City. Uh, Allie? Hi, I'm Allie. Oh, oh go. Which oh, Allie? Allie? Two. Allie, Allie, <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, with two L's and Allie with one L. Okay, Allie with two L's, you go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Allie Girth, um, project manager, landscape architect on the KU side with facilities planning and development. <laughs> uh, the area was we usually have Don and John problems, and now we have an Allie problem. So, okay. So, uh, Allie Edelman. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon, Allie Edelman. I'm Director of Sustainability for Wendell. I oversee our sustainability, our climate resilience initiatives, and I work um, also from the research side with the National Academy's uh, Transportation Research Board on some of their panels for sustainability, climate resilience, and transportation. And I chair the uh, APTA's Climate Guidelines Committee. Okay, uh, Chris Colvin. Hi, I'm Chris Colvin with Wendell. I'm a mechanical engineer and specialize primarily in the transit industry and in alternative fuels. Okay, uh, John Grabowski. Hi, I'm John Grabowski. I'm a project manager here at Wendell with an ecological background. Um, I work on a lot of projects across a lot of different sectors for us, but um, when working on projects like this, just looking at things from that ecological lens and um, like things like how we're dealing with water on site. So be looking at some of those things. Okay, uh, Emily. Hi, I'm Emily Lubliner and I work in communications for Lawrence Transit. Uh, Aaron. Everybody, good afternoon. Aaron Quisenberry with KU Transportation Services. I work with the KU on Wheels bus system and other components of transit on the KU campus. Okay, uh, Donna. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Donna Holtine and I'm uh, with Transportation Services at KU. 
Uh, Russ. Hi, uh, I'm Russ Bellows. I'm an electrical engineer at Wendell, and I specialize in public transportation and anything electrical in those in those types of facilities. Uh, Mark. Afternoon. I'm Mark Reiskam, University. I'm architect and director of facilities planning and development. Okay. Uh, Serena. Hi, um, I'm Serena Pearson, and I am um, marketing specialist with Lawrence Transit. Uh, Jasmine. Hello, I'm Jasmine Moore. I'm the sustainability director for the city of Lawrence and Douglas County. Great. Uh, Nate. Hey, uh, excuse me. I'm Nate Will, uh, civil engineer for the project uh, based out of Colorado, but I have two guys, our company's based out of the Kansas City area, so we've got a lot of local knowledge, but I'm the kind of lead all the transit type projects for our company. Uh, Callie. Kaylee. Hi, I'm Callie Long. I'm Associate Vice Provost for KU Operations. So that's um, FPD, so Mark, um, and Transportation Services. Um, so Donna Quiz, Margretta, who we haven't talked to yet. And Allie, sorry, Allie, FPD. <laughs> Okay. And Margareta? Yes. Um, and then did I, uh, we have Tony Kellen um, that you've met, Taryn, who's, um, who's helping me um, it, within the architectural design of the project. Sue Sherwood is also here, not on the screen, but she's our project manager. And I'm Scott Neal. I am your uh, project architect for this, uh, for this facility. Um, is there anyone I missed? I don't see any call in, but anyone else who didn't introduce? Okay. Uh, so with that, um, welcome to the sustainability and resiliency piece of this. Like I said, this is not uh, <clears throat> this is not necessarily specific to the project, but it can be. We're going to um, put out some things that uh, will get your mind uh, wandering to into um, yeah, the ideas of a resilient facility and some of the sustainable, sustainable features of the project. Uh, and with that, I think, uh, Ali, are you going to share your screen and kick us off here? Um, before, before we do that, any, any general um, uh, questions or concerns before we jump into the, to the presentation? And we certainly don't mind being interrupted during the presentation because I, I think that's a that's a good way to get a dialogue going. Okay, so Ali, um, you I will unshare and oh, you should be able to share actually. <clears throat> okay, is everybody able to see my screen? Okay, great. Thanks, Scott. All right, so as Scott mentioned, please, if you have any questions or comments that we can capture during this conversation, that, that's great. Please don't uh, worry about interrupting me. We wanted to have this so that we could look at sustainability and climate resilience from the 30,000 standpoint right now, foot standpoint, instead of trying to come to you with any kind of you know, thoughts on solutions or what this should look at and get your feedback because this is really an ongoing process. And I wanted to start this off with framing a little bit about um, more of our approach to projects with this so that we can frame it in a way that uh, makes sense. And with the sustainability that I have up there, we really reference this as no regrets design. What that means and refers to is it's just, it's good design, it's sustainable design and certain design strategies that just make sense, right? So you would do it no matter what, taking away climate resilience or um, extreme events. The climate resilience piece of it, that really looks at those three aspects up there. How do you absorb shocks? How do you absorb stressors and still have good functioning? How do you restore after a shock or an event? And then your adaptive capacity. 
So how you adapt to stressors, how you adapt to a changing climate. And then we look at those aspects and we try to find design options that meet both the sustainability and the climate resilience piece. But a lot of times they're synergistic, sometimes they're not. And when they're not, that means that we need to have a conversation to understand your priorities and what makes the best uh, sense for the project. And moving it away a little bit from just sustainability and climate resilience, I wanted to share with you kind of a framework of how we look at the connection piece of it. And as John Grabowski mentioned, uh, you know, he's got an ecological background. I do, there's a lot of folks in our team that have a scientific background as well. And we look at things from this connected aspect, right? If, if we took the snapshot of where, you know, this is just a little area of where the building uh, would be. And you think of that as the main functioning purpose and an ecological principle that would be like the organism. And you start thinking about how does that connect out more to the community and the community being the different aspects within that direct surrounding area. And then you move out more to what would be considered the ecosystem, right? So you have from the organism to the community to the ecosystem and all the different pieces that parlay into how the facility functions the impacts to the facility and uh, the impacts to the community. And at the very beginning, one of the things that we would like to do is really understand and do a vulnerability assessment at a high level with you, because that allows us from a climate resilience standpoint to understand what really are the exposures, right? What are your exposures and your sensitivities? What are your vulnerabilities? And that starts laying out the path for what are some design decisions that help reduce the risk when it comes to extreme events or it comes to climate change? And it's both looking at hazard risk and from a design standpoint, a lot of times code will really take into account um, the hazard risk piece of it. Disaster risk and looking at the impacts of this, that takes, uh, kind of refers us back to the resilience part of your ability to adapt and your ability to bounce back. So doing the, a vulnerability assessment really early on, even if it's a high level one, is a very helpful tool in designing the climate resilient and sustainability goals for the project. And then this is, there's a, a little bit of a difference when we look at from sustainability and resilience, the data. So with sustainability and the no regrets kind of strategies, it's really based on historical data, right? What, 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 what do we see happening? What are the events, whether it's extreme weather events, the temperature, the precipitation, if you're looking at, let's say even from an energy modeling perspective, you use that historical data to be able to look at what are your efficiencies? What are the best thing strategies for the project? Then you start taking a look more at the real time and you look for things that are changing scenarios or, or what we call impact modifications. Sometimes they're just anomalies. Sometimes it's the beginning of a, of a trend. And so you wanna make sure that you're asking questions based upon this when you're looking at uh, some of the design goals. And then moving into future projections. And this is a lot of times where teams will, will stop. We look at historical data, they look at kind of the real time data, but not the projections. And that's something that we do because it's important when you're looking at, well, how are the design decisions that we're making going to impact and either be synergistic or work against us in the future? And one of the things here, like this is an example, this is taking from a, a projection, future projection model for Lawrence. And you can see there's you know, the, the gray in the graph in the bottle, that's kind of the historic data. And then you see the red line and the blue line, those are just taken from different models. Um, and the increase in heating degree days, or excuse me, uh, days over 105 degrees Fahrenheit on top is taken from a different model. And the whole point here is when you look at a projection like this, we know there's uncertainties. We know it's not an absolute, but, but if we know this, then we can think about our design and say, what, are, what is this extreme heat gonna do to our impact in our energy usage in the facility? How is that gonna impact the comfort of the workers or the occupants within the facility? How is the air quality going to decrease? Because we know that happens when we have the extreme heat days. And how do we look for ways to either mitigate this on site? How do we have areas of respite? Um, how do we reduce heat island impacts? 
So the future projections, even uncertain, are important. And then the other thing we look at, even though these dates are well out there, even something as far as what we're planting, irrigation needs, species migration, something that we, we know is happening where uh, changes in temperature, changes in precipitation, different species are migrating up. How is that going to impact the design? It may not be something that is included into it, but if we have the data, we can ask the questions and we can see what, what options there are. We can start being innovative of how we're looking at these things. And then the other part of it is the community impact. This is an area around Lawrence and really what it's taking a look at, and there's many different maps and models that we'll, we, we take a look at is looking at what are demographics, what are the proximity to uh, congestion, maps that overlay this, that look at ozone and particulates and, and diesel so that you start getting a better picture of who's being impacted and where and where public transportation is adding benefits to it. So it, it, it helps again with that storyline to understand the impacts. Any questions so far or any comments? Make sure I'm just not talking through all of this. Okay. And then looking at some of the synergies and trade-offs, kind of pulling it back from the overarching community and regional um, aspect of it, start looking at all these different things and how they tie together and the synergies, the trade-offs that are gonna come around. This is, um, I thought it'd be interesting to see a graphic that we did kind of some similarities between this project as far as a campus and transit working together. This is on Virginia Tech. We're working with Blacksburg Transit on a project that they wanted to have as a sustainability demonstration. And with this, this fly through, taking a look at here, the facility itself, we get a close view here. The facility itself is over in this area. But all of this, the consideration to the site, how people move through here, how they feel as they're moving through here. We had cisterns, underground cisterns and above ground for education. Art was incorporated into it, daylighting um, on the canopies here, covered with solar panels, as well as rainwater capture from the, um, from the canopies themselves. So all the different things that can be captured within here, and then share it out in the, the, your, your story and how you communicate out with the, uh, the public. Moving more into the facility standpoint, now this is taking a look at, you know, once we understand the vulnerabilities, doing that high level vulnerability assessment, we've worked with you and we understand your sustainability goals and really kind of what those no regret strategies can be as we move forward. And then where are the important pieces of the climate resilience um, priorities. These are looking at how we can put together from here um, different parts of a plan. And this would be looking at more of like your overarching energy plan. And that'll take into consideration, okay, we have you know, um, passive ventilation and operable windows. Are there opportunities, even though it's a small facility for ground source heat pumps to close that delta for heating and cooling? Is solar one of the options here, whether it's traditional solar on the roof or even though there's differences in efficiencies, thin film for things on top of canopies or different applications. And then here, even though this is a maintenance facility, one of the companies that we really like to use a lot, whether it's in a, a big space like this or even in a small space, and I have folks who use this in their homes as well, um, these fans. And for those of you who have heard of this company, it's, it's not obscene, but it's the name of the company and it's big ass fans. And uh, that's, that's what they are. And they really help overall in the mechanical strategy and moving the air around and in, in, in the overall kind of energy plan. And then moving on to the site because the site piece of it happens in tandem. And there's a lot of different options here. And whether that is looking at the a green roof, swales, um, rain gardens, just like in that last slide, I talked about having it more of an overall energy plan. If we think of water as a resource, not just as stormwater that needs to be mitigated, then you start having water as a resource plan. And it takes a look in into account what's happening in the building, as well as what's happening outside the building for the uh, rainwater and stormwater. 
And these are good traditional approaches. So we were thinking about well, what else could be a little out of the box. Now, here's what I mean by kind of an out of the box collaboration. I'm part of your site in the background there. You know, that might be an area that's used for stormwater retention. And if it has a slope or steep slope, which I believe it, uh, it, it does, one of the things that is being looked at and used in different areas is almost this vertical farming, micro farming. And it's where it's a tiered aspect and it's a, a great best management practice for stormwater. And if it could be in collaboration, let's say with the university, with their uh, student farm group or with some of the um, other groups that they have going on there, they have their crops to campus as well. Think about that is an, um, is an innovation and it may be something that's not feasible, but we wanna bring these kind of ideas here. That would be a great connection and story to have these vertical gardens, perhaps seasonal, that would be able to supply uh, to a market, a little market there or whatnot back to this. <laughs> and then the health and wellness piece of it is, uh, is critical, right? Because whether it's the building occupants, the community, um, the people working there, how people feel within the facility makes a difference. Right. And, and here in these two pictures on the left, this is from a project we did in Lynchburg. And the um, glazing that you see here, the doors actually, you know, those function in a way where it was where people moved comfortably in and out. It served to, for natural daylighting, served for natural ventilation. So this was very synergistic in what was what they wanted with their sustainability goals. As far as in this, this picture all the way to the right here, I wanted to show this because again, it's about thinking about options. Within the facility, if there's somewhere that maybe can't get natural daylighting, there are options. These tubes coming down here, those are solar tubes. These go up to the roof and they really do work very well, just funneling in natural daylighting. So that we don't just look at a space and say, well, there's no glazing here, or this isn't possible, so no natural daylighting. It's taking in and like yeah, the energy plan and the water is a resource plan. This is kind of your human experience plan. And then with the bike here, we know that biking is an important in connecting between the community and the university. And are there options within the space to have a small little bike amenities uh, in the program? Different ways to, again, pull together that, that human experience in the space. And then I'm gonna turn it over to, I think uh, Dan's gonna talk a little bit more on the, um, on the energy side of things. But as we move through some of these, the design strategies that we wanna take a look at is really a part of communicating out and telling the story. So that people are able to see and learn about your sustainability and resilience goals in action and the different collaborations that you may have going on with the stakeholders. All right, so I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Uh, and Dan, am I turning it over to you? Sure, I can, I can go over some items. Okay, great. Um, let me... So can everybody see the screen? Okay, great. So yeah, again, I'm Dan Audet. I work with the, uh, uh, the energy team here at Wendell um, and just gonna go over a few things related to energy efficiency. You know, we, uh, you know, we are, you know, mostly for this is to just kind of give you some ideas of things you may be able to look at during the design process. Also, you know, what good strategies are for approaching energy in the building. Um, just to kind of help you visualize the, the potential benefits there. And um, the first thing uh, we'll show you is, you know, average energy consumption for these types of facilities. So CBEX is a, uh, uh, it, it, so there's a study done on, you know, based on where you are in the country, what type of building it is. It's an average of how buildings use energy on a square foot basis. And 
the the uh, benefit of that is, you know, obviously a big building is going to use more energy than a little building. Um, but when you normalize that against square footage, you can kind of get an understanding of what's what's kind of average for these types of facilities. So what we've shown here is what the average uh, uh, a, a transit facility is um, based on the CBEX 2018 study. Um, you know, what the target would be for, you know, just an average new construction building. Because remember that the average is based on, you know, buildings that could be very old, very new. Um, so we gave you a target of, you know, what could be reasonable for a new construction, newly constructed facility. And then one that could be achievable for, you know, one that incorporates a lot of uh, energy efficient, uh, energy efficiency measures into the design. Um, and, you know, Assuming a rough square footage of the building uh, with a rough number put towards energy costs, uh, you know, what that actually translates to. So an average for, you know, a, a small building might be around $4,000 a year uh, with a high efficiency design, you know, you could maybe cut those costs maybe in half. So, um, you know, the point of this is to, you know, just kind of get a sense of what the overall energy consumption would reasonably be and what those costs would be. And when we look at energy efficiency technologies, it's, you know, you know, a lot of people will look at first cost. A lot of people will look at the actual energy savings you're getting from it, what that means in dollars and kind of calculating all of that together for a project that's a good payback. And what we do on the energy side is, you know, a lot of our projects are driven by, is it cash flow positive from the beginning? So that's something that, you know, we, we normally pay a lot of attention to, and that's something we could be uh, working through with you on this. Um, and just to keep things simple, um, you know, we've put together a list of some uh, technologies that might be worth exploring here. And so the thought process here was, uh, I believe you guys' utility is Evergy, who has pretty good utility rebates available if you live in Kansas. Um, so they're only available in Missouri right now, but based on our, we, we've had some discussions with them lately. Um, it's our understanding that they're in the process of trying to launch uh, similar programs uh, in your area, maybe within the next like year or two, there could be something available. But uh, so, We've highlighted some technologies that are incentivized in, you know, other programs that they offer, which may or may not be available to you. But regardless, these are good technologies that, you know, should be explored during the design because, again, the cost of the, of the uh, product, you know, with the energy savings that you get from it almost always talk, you know, add up to a good project. So, you know, obviously we'll be looking at LED lighting in, in, in the building. Um, you know, lighting's usually around, depending on building type, 20 to 40% of a building's energy consumption. Modern LEDs almost always, you know, pay for themselves. Uh, incorporating good controls into a building, like occupancy sensors that when it doesn't detect somebody for a while, it turns the lights off, saves a lot of energy. Um, same with daylight controls where you can kind of, uh, where, the, where uh, if you have good natural lighting in a building, these sensors will say, hey, you, you've met your light levels. Um, you know, we don't need to use this electric light at the moment or as much of it. So those are always good strategies to incorporate. Uh, it, it sounds like electrification might be a uh, goal for you guys, whether it's long-term or short-term. Uh, there's a lot of different, uh, electric, energy efficient electric uh, conditioning we can be using for, for heating and cooling. So VRF's a good system. You can see a diagram of that uh, above. What it is, is you have a big condensing unit outside. Um, you know, it, it varies the amount of refrigeration that handles the heating and cooling. Um, it, 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 essentially, it's high efficiency. You can control it well. And if you guys ever plan on expanding the facility, you can add on. It's, it's, th there's a lot of benefits there. Geothermal is something we could always explore as well. You know, heat pumps so it would be, you know, likely heating the building with an electric heat pump. Um, the, you know, you'd be drilling holes into the ground where that would uh, 
do a lot of the heating, a lot of the cooling, you know, by the temperature of the earth would, uh, you know, raise or you, you'd get a lot of free cooling from just matching the temperature of the earth. So, um, you know, some, some things are good control strategies you can do on the HVAC side, uh, demand controlled ventilation is, you know, something that's more and more, uh, becoming, uh, adapted in buildings. Uh, that's something that reads the CO2 in a space. It knows how many people are in the space and it adjusts your, uh, mechanical ventilation to drive down a lot of energy costs, you know, buildings where there's like a variable occupancy, or, you know, you might have a high peak number of people, but, you know, throughout the day, it's not really being used by that many. It's a good way to drive a lot of savings for a very, you know, small upfront cost. Uh, energy recovery is, uh, you know, what you see in the bottom right here. Uh, if you have a lot of exhaust air in the facility, you're doing, you know, mechanical ventilation. Uh, this helps recover some of the heat or cooling that you might be losing and, you know, can add up to a lot of, a lot of savings. And then variable speed drives, which help, you know, lower the, uh, uh, you know, help, help motors not run at full speed all the time, add up to a lot of savings, whether that's on the fans or I don't know if, you know, we'd be incorporating, you know, air compressors into the facility for uh, process tasks, but uh, Evergy right now has a program in Missouri for air compressors with variable speed drives. It's, you know, maybe something, if it's available in Kansas, we could explore that going forward. So uh, again, the, the point of this is to just give you some ideas of uh, technologies that can be explored and you may have rebates available, uh, you know, when uh, things start getting put together here. So again, it, some of these are more expensive technologies. They do lead to energy savings and anything we can capture up front to lower that upfront cost are uh, things that'll, you know, things that we'll be considering to, you know, when we're looking at this. So I, I, that should be everything we had on our end, uh, Allie and Scott. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think one of the other areas we were talking about was um, uh, battery electric um, bus. So John, I don't, um, did you want to go next or? Sure, I can go next. Okay. And again, feel free, you know, I saw Jasmine, um, it, I, it's good to know by 2035, you're, you're going to um, renewable sources. So that's probably a worthwhile discussion on how we plan the here and now, and then what does 2035 look like? So to accommodate that. <clears throat> <clears throat> Can everybody see my screen? Okay, I thought I'd start out first with, with solar uh, because I know one of the things that we do whenever we look at uh, battery electric bus systems and, and even intermodal systems is we look at solar panels because solar is a, a good way, there's space available or it's a good way to do uh, some, some uh, green energy at the same time. And in looking at what Evergy has to offer now, of course, Kansas is not a deregulated state, as you're probably aware, uh, which limits your options somewhat. But Evergy has been a pretty progressive uh, utility in certain ways. They did adopt net metering in 2009, uh, which means that you can uh, put solar in on your facility. And if there's excess, you can sell it back to the grid. Uh, their current net metering project will allow up to 100 kilowatts of uh, clean energy generated on the customer side of the meter. Uh, that includes solar panels. Now, they will allow in excess of that if you, you know, plan and work with the utility. And in conversations with them, a project such as this, uh, they would most likely consider uh, additional above and beyond the 100 kilowatts if, if it made sense for that particular site. Uh, but you would have to work with them or we could work with them on your behalf. Uh, the other thing is, is that what you can do if you're not interested in owning and operating and maintaining the solar panels, uh, you can do a third party build, own, operate. There's a lot of companies out there, very reputable, that would be willing to come in and you know, build the solar panels on your structure and you know, operate them, maintain them, and you could take advantage of having the solar power and the solar recs. Uh, that is you know, a well 
a well proven uh, way of implementing these projects. Now, also what I learned is Evergy also will do that. Evergy through the regulated utility will provide build and operate maintain installations. So they will be willing to work with you and you can get advantage of having that solar panel without having the, the you know, problems of maintaining it and operating the system. Another option that Evergy options uh, uh, provides is a solar garden, which in essence is a community solar program. It's very common throughout the country where developers will develop uh, a big solar project and then sell off pieces of it to the, anybody that's interested in buying it. Uh, that is in essence what Evergy has. They have a community solar project and they'll, you can buy that from them. The other piece they have is a renewable energy program and you can purchase renewable energy direct from uh, Evergy uh, to help meet your goals. So there's a, quite a few programs that Evergy uh, offers and uh, we can help you work through those as well. Now for- I might, I might break in. I might have Jasmine, you mind speaking briefly about the uh, relationship the city and Evergy have for renewable energy? Uh, so um, last year, we entered into an agreement with Evergy for a wind subscription. And so we are, for our current facilities, um, able to, through that wind subscription, pretty much source like 98% of our energy through the, the wind subscription. Um, so I know we have a couple more facilities coming online in addition to this one. So I was just thinking about like um, of these options, what which would be preferable for these new facilities, bringing them on. Um, the agreement we have with Evergy is for 20 years. And so um, right now we don't, that I know of, have the option of increasing that subscription, um, but it would be probably a new agreement uh, if we wanted to um, think about how this facility plus the new police facility plus the new MSO facility and what the um, energy use for those three facilities might look like and if that's enough to subscribe to the the win to increase our subs subscription there um, so so that's just some context we just started that uh, contract last year um, Adam did it did that provide the context you're hoping for yeah, that's great. I just wanted the Wendell team to be aware of that. Yeah. Nope, I appreciate that. And that's probably through their renewable energy program, I would imagine. Uh, solar can be, un be done on top of that. So if you wanted to look at solar for this particular project, that's, that's still a viable option as well. The, the city and does. Oh, I just, I just wanted to add for the, the wind subscription, we were actually able to um, subscribe to wind at a lower price point than our regular Evergy bill. And so that was an additional um, incentive for us as we were, we're saving about $100,000 a year by going through that program. So it's not an additional cost, it's actually a cost savings for us. Right, yeah, that's and that's actually in their tariff. I was reviewing that the other day. It's a, it's a very nice program. Uh, it's, it's one that, uh, that Evergy has that I have not seen by many utilities. It's a, it's a robust program. The city currently does have a lot of PV on a fire station not far from this site. Yep. Now, did you, does Evergy own that or did you decide to own that yourself? Uh, you know, I'm not sure on how that. Okay. Uh, because I know Evergy has built some for the city in some locations and uh, I believe they own some. So I think you've done it both ways. Okay, I'm just going to talk for a minute about alternative fuels. Uh, we do and have been doing alternative fuels since the uh, uh, early 19, uh, 1990. Uh, we do propane, electric, compressed natural gas, hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, what you're seeing here is a picture of our Wooster Regional Transit Authority uh, en route charger. You can see the, uh, the charger is the big box with the two vents at the top. That's a 500 kW charger that charges the bus as it comes into this intermodal facility. There's also a train station here. Uh, what you can't see real well is a pentagraph that comes down from the top of the canopy onto the bus as the bus pulls in and loads and unloads passengers. The charger drops down, charges the bus while the bus is there. 
and uh, then moves on. So that's a pretty common en route. Uh, what's being becoming more popular now is uh, induction charging, which are pads in the concrete or on top of the concrete. Uh, so you don't have the pentagraphs, uh, which in the Northeast have been a problem. I'm not sure that in Kansas, the, the pentagraphs would become much of an issue for you. Uh, but there are a lot of different options for that. The other thing is, is I've been talking to Evergy about uh, what they can do and what they do do for transit. Uh, they do have an electric transit service rate uh, for electric buses, a basic service fee of $29 and the energy charge. Off-peak is about 2.07 cents per kilowatt hour. On-peak about 14, uh, plus all the other adjustments and surcharges. I have to tell you, this is one of the best rates I have seen for transits for battery electric buses across the country. Uh, there are no demand charges, and uh, it's, it's a pretty nice program or a nice rate. Uh, the only requirement I think really is, is that the bus charging must be on a separate meter. Uh, and can't be behind the meter of the rest of the facility. Uh, what they are also working though on is a transportation electric electrification portfolio. And that is currently into the commission for approval and they expect approval within a year. But some of the components of that is they will be providing rebates for and, and allowances for distribution improvements so if there was a need to increase or improve the distribution to a facility that's providing electric charging to a bus, uh, there will be uh, some incentives and benefits to doing that. Uh, the other thing is they're looking for rebates for chargers and charging equipment uh, to help uh, offset some of the cost of switching and, and electrifying vehicles. So they're, they're one of the more progressive uh, utilities from a battery electric bus perspective. One of the other things that you can do and is being done across the country, again, being in a non-deregulated state is a little bit more complicated because you can't do a power purchase agreement in, in your area. But there are companies out there that are willing to build, own, and operate the charging equipment as well and just charge you a charging rate uh, so that you don't have to necessarily purchase that equipment if you don't want to. So you know, there are some advantages to that. Uh, and in talking with Evergy, they may consider that as well. Right now, they have not done that, but given what they're doing in solar, they're looking at it and it's an area that they may be interested in pursuing at some point in time. I might provide some context here too. Um, so we were fortunate to win a 2020 low no emissions um, yep, saw that. grant for five electric buses. Um, we have been working closely with Evergy uh, they're upgrading some utilities out at our maintenance facility that KU owns. Um, so they're upgrading a transformer and moving some electricity to be more conducive to where we're going to have our actual chargers. Um, with our service and just the, our span of service and the current battery technology, we're hopeful that we will always be able to uh, do overnight depot charging um, and still be able to meet our, our route range needs. Um, some modeling shows that we, we have to choose certain routes a, a little more intentionally to, to do that, at least at the start, but we're hopeful that over time, battery technology gets uh, better range and lighter batteries to help us continue that um, because you can obviously see the big difference between off-peak charging and on-peak. So if we can do our charging from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. and still be able to complete our vehicle blocks during the day, that's preferable. So, I think that some of the direction we've given to Wendell is to, um, we want to be, we want to future proof by thinking about on route charging at the facility, um, particularly about Billings and Crestline, um, with the hope that hopefully technology won't force us to do that just because it's such a huge space and cost investment and maintenance and all of that. So, just some context, we are, um, I guess, to build off of what uh, Jasmine said in the chat as well with the city energy goals to have municipal operations um, using renewables by 2035. Uh, that, that really pushes us to try to replace diesel buses with electric buses each year. So we've got uh, certainly some zero emission transition planning ahead of us to make sure that we can operationally do that. Um, 
uh, if we if we don't buy any more diesels, <laughs> we will hit you know our, our buses that we bought in 2020 would reach their use in the useful life in 2034, and we would just make the deadline. Um, but that would that will require, I think, technology to get a little bit better and range to get a little bit farther. But we're hopeful that continues to move that way. I will tell you that uh, today's battery technology, not the technology that's being sold with the buses today, but the today's current battery technology is about twice the capacity that the technology that's in the buses that are being sold. And it's going to be about five to six years, I'm being told, before today's battery technology will be commercially available in the buses. So it's looking like, you know, that range is going to increase, possibly double, um, but I would I'll be hesitant to say double, but it is going to increase significantly once the new generation of batteries make their way into the production line of new battery electric buses. So, and, uh, you know, obviously you're right. I mean, Evergy has really designed this rate for depot charging. They really, you know, are looking for people to charge off peak because they have, you know, they have the capacity off peak and they don't need to add generation or transmission if, you, if transit agencies will charge off peak. So uh, hopefully that's the way it heads, but you know, I agree with, with where you're headed. And that's all I had, Scott. All right. You know, one thing, um, one thing in this conversation, you know, uh, we when we show these daylighting slides, we're we're typically showing occupied spaces. But one of the things I like to say is that you know, um, you know, uh, lighting and lamps more often than not um, uh, occur in 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 spaces such as corridors and and functional things like closets and things, <clears throat> and. Uh, and, 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 and they're not, they're not, it's not a terribly um, hard thing to figure out how to daylight. So <clears throat> I guess the reason I'm bringing that up is that in an ideal world, this building and its footprint is small enough that um, it's, it's quite possible to, to make this um, uh, net zero outside of obviously charging a bus. <laughs> But I think um, you know this 2035 plan for a project type of this uh, like this um, is is quite possible if we put our heads together. So, um, but that's uh, I believe that's everything. I think Russ and Chris, we we decided you're staying on in a, like a for for question and answer. Um, but from what you heard. Um, uh you know is there is there anything that piqued your interest or you had questions on i'm happy to see so many different ideas a lot of things i hadn't thought of or seen before i think that's kind of how we laid out the proposal for you all as we are interested in a very sustainable building and site um but don't really know what we don't know so it's um Maybe not as simple as just looking, can we put solar on the canopy? Uh, you know, there's a lot of other things you need to think about doing. So um, I suppose I'm, I'm interested in a lot of it. I don't know, uh, will, we, will we see some of these things just start to get integrated into some of the concepts? And at that point, we will be making decisions about, you know, yes, keep pursuing this idea or, um, you know, we might get some intel from you on you can do this, but it'll you know it'll be dramatically change the upfront cost, for example. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a good question, Adam. So, so for starters, um, you know, the we're we're going to start with you know obviously we have a very uh, we have a very contoured site. So first and foremost, you know, if we're laying this out, you know, we've got to we've got to make sure that this. Is a is a functional transfer center that we're meeting mobility um, needs, and then the orientation of the building is going to speak to the daylighting and the natural ventilation and the idea of um, you know comfort for the for the riding uh, public, and then depending on that orientation, that's going to explain how the roofs get set up 
and how the canopy system setups, then that's going to end up informing what a possible array size could be for uh, for photovoltaics if we decide we do want to 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 do the roofs. And then how does that fit in with uh, stormwater capture if we want to collect rainwater, or maybe quality is more important, so maybe we're considering a green roof. So. So that's kind of how these things build off each other. So come Thursday, I think, if you're up for, um, you know, having us put our heads together on these things, I'm explaining this because they, they kind of fall like dominoes that it's like, okay, this is, this, this is about what we could do um, from an area point of view for photovoltaics, or this is what we think um, the facility could do if we did 100% daylighting because the footprint is narrow enough that we could do that. Um, and then um, maybe some high level civil calcs on, you know, how much um, uh, rainwater we're filtering to the, um, or channeling to the Northwest corner with the new per um, impervious areas. So, uh, and then we can, we can sort through that on the, on, on which ones are economical. I'd like to look at it too, from a long-term maintenance perspective. I know green roofs um, start out looking really good, but they tend to be one of the most difficult things to maintain over time, as well as permeable parking lots. Um, in my past work, depending on which kind you use, um, installation can be really tricky, and also if you don't have a vacuum truck, different things like that, you're not really able to clean certain types of permeable pavement. So just looking at trying to do cutting edge stuff, but also balancing practicality and um, working with some of our great city teams. I know we have a really good parks and rec department. If we wanted to look more in the landscaping and plants department rather than, you know, some of the more cooler sounding, but really struggle to, to maintain over the life cycle of the project. Like for example, green roofs are a lot more heavy. So you got to beef up the structure. So yeah, there's a lot of parts and pieces that you got to think about and to go, you, you said net zero. So is that a 50% adder to the HVAC system? I mean, those, there's a give and take to all that. Oh my gosh, wow. Yes. Yeah. The, the give and take is what we're going to be looking at. Um, you know, the, in a facility like this, um, what we, what we know, um, you know, outside of the, what private development or TOD there is, we're going to have a lot of flushing toilets. So we've got a, we've got a high square footage cost on, on plumbing in a facility like this more so than you would end up just because you don't have, you know, the, the other spaces. So, you know, perhaps it makes more sense that we're going to be considering like gray water, you know, capture for, uh, for the, for that toilet use, or maybe we're using it to irrigate. Um, and it may very well be that the green roof doesn't make sense, but I think that, um, but I think though that in, in the, in the dialogue coming up, um, you know, we're going to propose, you know, that, that idea of here's the upcharge if we want to go down that path. Um, but this isn't, you know, in, in, from what I'm seeing, Gary, I don't, I don't see this being a terribly energy uh, intensive, um, you know, facility at this point. Hey, Adam, this is Nate real quick on, just coming from Colorado where the water laws are absolutely crazy. I always tried to see what's, what you need to do for collecting rainwater. Is, is there someone from your, from the city staff we can talk to to make sure that whatever we're proposing is legal? <laughs> Cause I'm looking up stuff for Kansas and it seems like it, it's legal to rainwater harvest, but there's a lot of stipulations. So I just want to make sure and we're just designing this out that if it's something we want to go up like for the gray water flushing, cause that is a great use for collected rainwater cause you don't have to treat it. So I want to make sure that we can do it. So I just don't know who yeah. we can talk to for that. So yeah, Gary, would you be able to help um, connect us with people in MSO or yourself that might be able to help answer those questions? Oh, I'll, I'll check with the uh, planning department, but um, I don't think there's any. But I will check with our planning or 
overview people. I'm just very cognizant of it because around here, people like I've had multiple projects where they come through and they're like, yeah, we can do all this stuff. I'm like, that's great. You can't. <laughs> so I just want to make sure we can if we do it. So I, I did a lead project where we were going to do rainwater harvesting to flush toilets and that city said, no, we don't want rainwater in our building. So, yeah. Yeah, you never know, right? So <laughs> I'll ask the question. All right. Thank you, Gary. I, Scott, I just wanted to add one thing. I think, um, Felisa, for your question, Adam, for your question as well, one of the great things about doing this early on is not having, let's say, one particular strategy in mind. Like this would be solar for here. Where hybrid, looking at different aspects of how things will play off with one another, it's almost of okay, um, doing the analysis. We have daylighting, we have natural ventilation. Can we use one of the fans in that space? Can we, is solar one of the best aspects perhaps to tie into this is geothermal one. So it's not, it's more of looking at the hybrids than just one set system and say, this is the way to move forward and understanding your concerns from like a maintenance perspective and then Jasmine, thank you very much for your, your chats, the city um, sustainability goals as well. That starts on that high level planning I was talking about, right? Looking at, okay, here are the goals of where we wanna hit, here's the feasibility, here are the things that work together and then start putting those design options together into something that works with the building and the site in tandem. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and to Ellie's, to Ellie's point, you know, we know we know we need we know we need glass and windows on on the facility. So that's that's a cost no matter what. Where we put those windows though is is the more important thing. And and so therefore that that's what we mean by low hanging fruit and how the building is oriented with the position of the sun. Where it starts getting expensive is you know. John was pointing out the rebate programs on solar. Um, that that's a capital cost for sure. Um, so that that's really the range we've got to walk, walk, walk through. And similarly, oh, we were talking yesterday about geothermal. Um, we've done uh, in in Michigan. We have a substantial um, intermodal facility that has. Uh, uh, a geothermal snow melt system that's boiler assisted and and they don't they don't shovel or plow snow um, on their facility and so what's the cost benefit there plus you no know, slip and fall instances so you know something we won't put those into the projects without discussing it with you but they certainly have a cost benefit um, to them uh, over time. And certainly I'm kind of curious with a, with a, with a, like a snow melt system here, simply because the, uh, you know, we did discuss the amount of ice that you have, uh, during the winter. So, and it doesn't have to be extensive. You know, the one in Kalamazoo, Michigan is 22,000 square feet. <laughs> um, it's rather large, but a facility this size may not, maybe it's just aprons or areas that are of concern. Um, so all those things. Yeah, we, def we definitely want to look at that. When, in our recent visits to Topeka and Kansas City, there were a couple of different approaches to snow melt. And, um, you know, one of in Topeka, they had uh, boiler systems that they, I think, have pretty significant maintenance on throughout time. And they kind of focus on their pedestrian areas. Um, Kansas City had a different approach where they uh, went with kind of a, a relatively new type of system that they've had a lot of functional challenges with, but cost them less on kind of a daily or monthly basis. Um, so there, there were different trade-offs in those two different systems. But I think if we can avoid some shoveling, you know, definitely with pedestrian areas for slip, trip, and fall challenges, but um, if there's ways to, to look at some of where the buses operate too, that would think, yeah. really help us avoid shoveling. Yeah. And FTA actually kind of came back on that. That that Kalamazoo has been open since 2006 and 14 years later from an asset point of view it looks like the day it opened and it's purely because we took 
the winter freeze thaw cycle out of the equation. And it's really remarkable. So um, it peaked FTA's interest because they were looking at it saying like, wow, we've got a 14 year asset here that looks a lot better than you expect in a Northern climate. So, so that's what I'm saying. The cost benefit is always an interesting conversation. Not exactly, you know, from a sustainability point of view, what I would call traditional, but certainly the fact that we're not repairing and spending resources that we typically do simply by putting in a system like that is certainly worth discussion. In Kansas, you got to watch out for geothermal drilling those wells where, because you got a lot of limestone shelves. So you oh. your boring costs to get through that limestone and understand that to make sure you understand your payback. Okay, good to know. I just want to highlight also Jasmine's comments only because there's um, a pretty strong focus on our strategic plan and how, you know, everything we're doing being driven by that. So, um, you know, early on in the presentation, I saw the word, you know, restorative. I think that's a key piece of our sustainability initiatives through the strategic plan. So, you know, not only mitigation, but um, how can we make it better? And in a lot of the uh, imagery and ideas you had showed around what we can do with stormwater and rainwater. I think that's, there's a lot of opportunity there. And I, I, I did a quick soil survey before, or like over the weekend before our meetings and the soils at the site don't necessarily, I mean, at the first blush aren't great for like infiltration. They're really impermeable soil. So we may have to do some more just filtering of the stormwater just as a heads up. So. I always, when I talk about doing, you know, infiltration, it's like, all right, what's the soils? And they're like all season D's. I'm like, nope, they're not great for infiltration. It's going to be really, really low percolation rates. So, but it doesn't mean we can't have green infrastructure. It's just kind of, you like I said, we're playing, we're trying to set the playing field of what we can work within. So. Yeah, the aren't good. Yeah. Right. No. Yeah. I was in a project in San Francisco and we had the Bay Mud and the one put infiltration stuff and that's like trying to percolate through plastic. I'm like, no, that's not going to work, guys. <laughs> so. so, Tony, can you guys hear Tony? No. Our sustainability team has not met Nate, who is our civil engineer on the project. So I just wanted Nate to introduce himself. Oh, I, I was on, I didn't introduce myself early on. Okay. I guess I missed that. So. You're eating your lunch. <laughs> that would have been could, good. could be. We've been we've been getting all kinds of creative eating. Um, <laughs> so so I like I like what Gary said about the limestone shelves. Are there other things? Another way of handling this is uh, it sounds like there's genuine interest in 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 pushing some of these things as long as you know you understand cost and benefit and things like that. But are there and, and, and Jasmine as well, you know, the things that seem to be resounding within the community itself, like these gardens. Um, are there things that are just outright no's, like don't, don't go down that road or we've tried that and just make no sense? Well, this, this is on campus of KU, so community gardens would have to be something that we'd have to run by KU to see if it's acceptable. I would assume. Um, hi, this is Allie with KU. As far as community gardens goes, we do have a student group that has a community garden um, not far from this site, but just past experience, we've ran into issues with maintenance of it because it's not something that our own personnel can do. Um, so students will be excited about starting it and then it just it just doesn't keep long term. So um, this is a city, city facility. So it, I guess it depends on whether the city has the capabilities to maintain that kind of garden. Thanks, Allie, for that context. I, I'll just offer um, the sustainability office. Uh, we manage the the other garden sites around the um, around the city, and so I think that 
I don't want to throw it off the table just because of logistics, but uh, if it's something that people are open to, um, I think it could be folded into our, our general common ground um, gardening program. Yeah, that's kind of where my head was at. Like, as long as there's a plan for management, then I don't want to take it off the table just because it might be a little more complex. Um, but I agree with that. I mean, if it's an only student-led project, I think we are subject to kind of that turnover and, and how does the momentum stay up? I know earlier today we had a discussion about a butterfly garden near the student rec center that was dedicated by a certain class and over the years has been less maintained or, or less cared for. So um, I'd be more comfortable if it was something like you mentioned, Jasmine, through the common ground program or something that would be, you know, consistently kind of guided and maintained. I think it would be good if there were, um, you know, community involvement, but also like a teaching opportunity. I know that um, the Mark has a garden at West Middle School so you have like the professional leadership of the Merck, but then you're teaching students how to garden. I don't know if that's a possibility with any of the partners involved. I think that's a great point, Emily. Um, and to build off that, thinking about how the whole building could be a teaching opportunity for specifically around like the sustainability features. Um, when I worked for another organization, like we used the building itself as a, a teaching tool. Um, and so I am excited about some of the features that y'all presented today. And that was going to be my comment too. So Emily, I'm glad you brought it up of how can we integrate like education elements um, so that all the features aren't hidden within the site, but like can be celebrated and, and highlighted um, and almost like a demonstration, like here's, here's a demonstration of what, um, of what these types of sustainable choices look like. Jasmine, that's on the flyover that I did. That's what we worked with Virginia Tech on. Um, and on another project, it was, it was pretty cool. Some of the things that were even hidden instead of having like a sign or, or whatnot, QR codes, because especially with the campus, they love it where people walking by, you have a QR code for something and just using your smartphone and it goes through what that strategy is, what are the savings, what are the benefits, because that way it does become very interactive. So some of the energy projects I worked on, you if you have a display kiosk that shows how much energy you're saving and stuff like that. So that's part of the educational piece from those projects. Absolutely. It's great. You can pull the real time for if there's PVs or if there's stormwater capture, all those different things that it really, it makes people feel like they're interacting with the facility while they're, while they're there. You can put the stationary bikes out on the platform for people to pedal to make up the delta to achieve our net zero. That's so they can power up their charge, their devices, right? Or, or that too. Pedal power oh, on devices. I've seen that have them, They have them facilities where it's like yeah. charge, charge your own phone. I can't go fast enough. That's my problem. <laughs> anyway, there's, I think, uh, so what I like about this is there's, you know, we can't, we can't do any of these things without a willing uh, stakeholder group. So I think our takeaway is that it sounds like we have a willing uh, stakeholder group to go down this journey. Um, I think we'll look um, I think we'll be looking at these, um, you know, cost benefits, rule out some, incorporate others, get creative, educate the people, um, educate the users. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm trying to, um, oh, uh, one, uh, and then along the lines, did you see Chris's comment, Gary, maybe that's for you. He was just inquiring on, you know. Uh, I think Adam just or, responded. Or Adam, to that. what's up? Adam just responded to it. He had a good explanation of the different departments and and being able to take it on, trying to figure out what they need to do. So I think oh. that's helpful. Nobody says they have a ton of free time. Yeah, but that's the way. I mean, that's the way it is, and we'll just coordinate. If we find ourselves falling short of what we need, then we'll oh, work okay. to figure out how to staff it or contract. Great. 
Adam, I did have a question maybe for you or Jasmine. Um, has have you done a vulnerability assessment? I know that there's obviously for the, the, the county hazard mitigation and disaster risk, but specific for the uh, transit and in the projects and within the city a vulnerability assessment. So this is Jasmine. Um, we have a uh, multi-county wide vulnerability assessment that was done for like the Kansas City metro area that would that include that included Douglas County. So um, we have that information, but we haven't drilled down um, okay. further than that. Thank you. And I don't have anything specific to Lawrence Transit. Everybody, this is Quiz at KU. I just had one quick question, probably for Adam and Mark Reiske. Um, this is all really cool stuff. Um, but I guess I kind of want to follow up, piggyback off of Allie's comment about the, the one community garden on the campus. Uh, Mark, are, do you see any issues with any of this stuff? Or would we be good to go ahead and move forward to explore some of these opportunities? Just want to double check from like the legal, it's on KU's ground kind of thing. I'm hoping there's there's nothing and we'd be good to move forward. I just wanted to have you chime in. Well, it, it's probably honestly more of an issue if it's on KU ground than if it's on what the city of Lawrence would have as a long-term lease. Okay. So I, I will tell you if it's on KU ground, we have a hard time um, maintaining because what, what ends up happening when it does fall into um, being non-maintained People expect um, our staff to do it, and we don't have staff to do that. So, you know, if it's, it, it would honestly be easier if managed under a city program if such, a, such an item occurred. Now, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that lays out with the land use, um, because that'll be an important part of it also. And it'd be, you know, to see where that's at. You know, we'd, I don't think we'd want a community garden necessarily on the corner. Of Bob Billings and Crestline, I, I don't see that being a real good option for us. Um, so I think we'd have to see where it'd be placed to quiz. Yeah. But, you know, on, on, on university property, I mean, we've had one that didn't do so well behind Wesley that kind of dried up. We've had the student one over by University Press that, like I said, when, when stuff's just starting to grow, they're very excited. When the weeds start to grow quicker and what they're growing, they become less excited very quickly. Um, so, you know, you know that that's the that's the conundrum we're in. And then, you know, it seems like facilities get drug into it. To There's try. been a long-standing one, I think, at the rec center too, hasn't there, or isn't there? I know there was a student initiative. I thought several well, years ago was, when the that was the butterfly. So that that's I got the you. butterfly garden they were referring to earlier. And like I said, that's like most of our student planning um opportunities yeah you know we do our replants and we always get relatively good participation in those it's the maintaining over time and and Allie can tell you more than because I, I I will I will admit I haven't shown up to a lot of replants I bet Allie's been to all of them since she's been to the university but it's the long-term commitment that's the hard one for students you know because they get all involved and then they leave yeah. yeah. And, and, and we want them to graduate and leave, you know, we don't, we don't want them around forever. So, you know, that's a good thing, but. Uh, okay. And then my, so leading into my second question on that is I, I don't know if we've ever had, had the final conversation on what, what the footprint will look like for, for, you know, however many acres. And so I just wanted to know, Mark, what are the total amount of acres that are possible for this project? Uh, we, we need to see what these plans look like, and then we'll we'll work towards that. I mean, you know, we had some preliminary plans, as you know, quiz um, long ago, and, you know, we um, we considered those. Um, the, the, the reality is we're, we're working on what would be land use agreement anyway, and it's a chicken and egg thing. We need to see what these layouts look like and what direction this thing's going so we can determine what land would be needed for it. Yeah. I guess, I guess I'm, uh, let me ask it a different way. What, is there up to 20 acres available for this project or is it like five to six? What's, what's the most that could be, could happen on this section? Do we know? Well, here, here's the deal. The, the project will start determining that because the further they go South, the further they're cutting into a hill and the more work they have to do in the hill, which becomes very expensive for this team. Um, 
you know, so I'll have to actually make my screen bigger now. There's no way in heck I can see what you're putting up right now. So I'm just showing the approximate study yeah. area. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll narrow down from this, but this is what we're looking at. You know, and and I will tell you, you know, previously when they've laid this out and, you know, maybe when it was being laid out before, we didn't know, but it always fit on this site quiz. Um, yeah. And and yeah. It did so relatively easily. Um, it, Chris, it, that's about five to six acres. What's outlined in that. red. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I remember. And again, I just for folks that have that aren't haven't seen the footprint or what what's possible or even cutting into the hill, you know, those kind of things. I mean, there's some really cool ideas. And, you know, if we want a rain garden or a community garden, um, you know, where do we put it? Do we need more land? Those kind of things. Is it worth the cost? Um, anyhow, that's I just wanted to throw that out. So. You know, so I, th I think the ideas come back and then we, we have to consider what those ideas look like quiz. You know, right now, you know, we're bailing the land in between Iowa and, and this site. So that's what we're using it for currently. One idea I'd like us to keep in mind, if not have the discussion now, but keep in mind is um, how visible the sustainability elements will be. I know in other communities have been in, you know, it's, it's like you can have solar on the site, but we don't want to see it. Um, and I know there will be certain aesthetic elements that KU will be looking for as, as this, you know, the master plan, a gateway into campus. Um, I do think there's some value in this community and people being able to see, you know, obviously that is a sustainability element that I see on, on the property. Um, so I'm just interested in, in some of these elements and what you can see from the road as you drive, walk, bike by them. and um, it, It'll be interesting to see what's presented at. I mean, right now we're talking about, you know, I, I know Quiz would love me to answer a question for one time in my life, but he's talking about real hypotheticals here where it's hard to answer a question, not knowing what it's going to look like. And, you know, so, you know, that that's, that's kind of where we're at. And it sounds like in a very short period of time, we'll know much more. Yeah. I, you're funny, man. I'm telling you. Um, my my just my general question kind of what I was getting at was even including the trees that wasn't outlined in the red you know whatever it was available for the city to lease what is that possibly is that 20 acres or are we really nope it's the five to six you, acres that's outlined you, you in the red probably really don't have 20 buildable acres there without jumping through real hoops of the bad stuff so I, I mean you're probably you're probably five and at the real outside you may be able to stretch it to eight acres but i i'm you know we also aren't going to do a lease for anything more than what's really needed for a for a reasonable program there's yep. no need to gotcha in and on a slightly different note but i think while we're at this high level planning stage and we can look at our budgets i think anything that can be included in a long term budget will be successful. And that's where a lot of things with sustainability or green infrastructure go off the rails is there's a capital budget and an initial upfront cost budget. And then there's not a long-term maintenance budget built in. And I think we can look at some of those things now and see how, you know, where we should put funds and how that should go so that we can have a long-term plan or, you know, there's a certain amount of years green infrastructure will last before you need to dig out a certain part and change the filter, depending on what type of system you put in or, you know, the regular weeding and maintenance and things like that. So I think all things are still possible, um, but that is the biggest indicator of success. Yeah. And, and that's going to be the same for the whole facility, to be totally honest. I mean, Adam's got to figure out how long his, um, his, you know, if he has charging stations on the site, which it sounds like he's going to, how long those will last and when he's going to have to replace those, when he's going to have to do canopy work. He's, you know, because I'll tell you the least, I think that he's going to want is going to be longer than some of these items are going to exist. So they're going to have to be a replacement cost somehow figured in the life cycle of, of this, of this facility. 
and Adam's young, he may be here through the entire thing. There's no chance for me. So, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. This is a very helpful discussion as we're thinking about things. And just, uh, you know, even with the green infrastructure, the ground source heat pumps that we talked about, this was to try to get the conversation going, hearing what you like, what you don't like, maybe what's lessons learned from the past. Um, now knowing, okay, we might have an issue with cost with limestone. There might be some soil compaction or soil characterization that we need to look at for it. Um, placement of different things. We start ruling out what doesn't make sense and then start looking at with the maintenance plans and the economics of it. How does that play parlay into it? When Dan was talking about the incentives, are there certain things that from a system standpoint would make good sense from sustainability goals, but then you also have a tie-in with the economics of it, what's coming down the road with uh, Evergy. So I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be a stepped approach. We're gonna have some stuff that we're working towards and some uh, things coming up over the next couple of days, but then it'll be a back and forth. This works because of X, Y, Z, this doesn't. Where do you like this? And, and it just starts narrowing it down. And I know that's, that's common sense, but it's not that we can throw out a design and say, this is, this is it. And then, you know, all options off the table, except for going back to maybe a traditional system, let's say. It's great to be able to hear all the good things as far as what you're looking for, and then all of the concerns so that we can, uh, we can start working through this. We've been mostly talking about the primary facility site out of Bob Billings and Crestline. And I guess I want us to also keep in mind the downtown improvements we'll be putting in there. Will certainly be a lot less opportunity for, um, you know, like water retention spaces, things like that. But if we can think of plantings and solar and, and different sustainability elements in that site as well, I think we'll be interested in seeing what that might look like. Great. Scalable. Taking items and making it scalable for that and what's appropriate for the, for the sites. I, I think, Adam, in that case, there, there is a there is, um, since, since we're likely redoing the sidewalks, it, it's certainly up for conversation on how we're, um, uh, on how we're irrigating uh, the street landscape and trees. So I think, um, I think that, you know, we mentioned silver cells before. Um, so I think there may be some some opportunities there that we can we can introduce those things, but I would agree. Just not having a, a an actual built program per se, I think it's more along the lines of material choices and landscaping and and what's smart there. Yeah, in other cities, I've seen curb cuts that can feed that um, planting strip or, or things like that that are more passive, I guess. But yeah, there's not a lot of like hard drainage infrastructure in there. So infiltration and that kind of stuff's gonna be, has to be more of that passive approach if we do it. I've seen plenty of approaches where you can do that and it gets a little more complicated. And that's where the like the maintenance part kind of comes into it or it gets a little more intricate to maintain, but the stuff we can identify. I mean, it's gonna be interesting too, Adam, to see how much of this size can be taken up with the tension or if you're gonna place it underneath. Because our net zero with the city, you've got a lot of pavement going in here. So yep. <laughs> that's going to change. That's going to change detention on this site pretty dramatically. It can be a combination. You know, when Kevin's our site civil guy has done a lot of underground detention in, in their region. So he's fully aware of how to make it work. So it might have, might have to be a combination of stuff just if we need the space, right? If we can't, if we need the space, it might have to be a combination of both. So. Well, we've done quite a bit of underground on campus um, yeah. relatively recently to be able to build projects. So mm -hmm. that may be something you just have to work in. But, you know, that's a viable option for um, possibly some of your watering. You'll be storing. Which is nice because around my parts, no one wants to do underground attention at all. You bring it up and they start running away. So it's nice to actually have it be available. So. Yeah. Yeah, this is, the city's never argued with us doing detention below paving as, a, as of yet. We've got below paving and below buildings. So there no one, as long as we don't dump it in the city at a quicker rate, we're, we're solid. Good. 
Mark, Matt, Matt Bond mentioned uh, 1.8 CFS per acre is what's allowed. I don't know if that number strikes off the top of your head. Um, that number sounds right. I just have to look and see what we've already got on that site because you're going to, you're going to credit back for some of that pre-existing construction on that site. So okay. let, let's, let's say, let's say you remove the whole building that's on that site. Let's just imagine that. Okay. Well, you, you know, basically the way the city land use agreement reads, we, we don't have to, we don't have to worry about that being detained because we're already sending it to storm directly. What they're going to be concerned with is all the new pavement that's not already covered. So all the, all the, you know, pervious site that we take up, that's what we got to start allowing for. And that's where we'll start getting into interesting um, detention. So All righty. Well, any uh, any final comments? And um, and if not, we'll, we'll let the group go here. If you have anything else, you certainly can reach out to the team, and we'll continue to add it to uh, to the list of things as this project develops. Out of one other thing that's uh, maybe pretty minor, but we. Um, while I don't know it's likely we have on route bus charging at this facility in the small parking area, we may want to plan at least for the conduit for electric vehicle charging. If our staff vehicles ever go electric, that hasn't been as focused of push from our fleet manager, but I suspect it will be as the city tries to meet sustainability goals in the future. So, um, you know, August of 2022, we might not be installing a charger, but the ability to do that in the future. Yeah, get, get the infrastructure under your concrete. You don't want to tear up concrete. Right. Yeah, right, now, right now, Adam, in the program, we have 15, we have 15 spots with five, uh, with five charging. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, I think that works. All righty, anything else? The three o'clock work session, is that at Doubletree? That's a private land work session. Yeah, this says um, we're gonna, we're gonna start um, putting the ideas together. So that's just the internal team. So that's not a, an actual meeting. Uh, by agenda, I think the next time, yeah, tomorrow morning, um, we'll give kind of some uh, preliminary uh, uh, thoughts and commentary. And then we work again. And then the afternoon, um, tomorrow afternoon, there's some of the public meetings. Um, so yeah, from here on out, we, we, start, uh, we start getting in the concepts, so. Preliminary findings tomorrow at 9 a.m. Yeah. Okay. And just yeah. to clarify too, the afternoon working session tomorrow is also the internal development uh, design team. It's not in the stakeholders. What is that? One thirty-five or three to five? Or? Yeah, 135, that's our designer working uh, with our internal team um, yeah. on the side. Yeah, so out, outside of the public meetings, uh, the only two meetings for this stakeholder group is tomorrow at 9 and Thursday at 9 is the wrap up. I'm excited to hear a couple of times of the day where I do not have a meeting. Sounds great to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we were just saying that these, uh, we are on site. So if anyone wants to join, um, we have these big rooms with a lot of social distancing. So. Yeah.
Okay. All righty. Well, with that, we'll, I guess we'll adjourn and uh, we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow morning.